Jews were very comfortable using pistis as an everyday word for faithfulness, loyalty, commitment. And so that kind of blew open that, you know, issue of is Paul representing it pistis as the opposite of working? And that, to me, that wouldn't make any sense at all, given the many, 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 many times that pistis is used uh, as as something you do. Even in Matthew 23, Jesus criticizes the Pharisees, saying, you neglected to do the weightier matters of the law, and he lists pistis as one of those things. So he actually links pistis and doing right there in Matthew 23. Welcome to Theology Curator, a podcast hosted by Kurt Willems and available online at theologycurator.com. Each episode looks at a theological, formational, or cultural theme. We might dig into the life and letters of a radical Jewish teacher named Paul, converse about a pressing contemporary issue, reflect on the nature of following Jesus today, or even attempt to remedy doom and gloom preaching with a good old-fashioned dose of hope. This show is an invitation to build bridges between the first century world of the earliest Christ followers into the 21st century reality we now inhabit. The Jesus we excavate from the rubble of tradition might just surprise us all. Hey friends, I want to welcome you back to Theology Curator. I'm Kurt Willems, and I'm excited to be able to present another interview to you today. I'm not going to introduce it long, but I just wanted to let you know that there's a lot going on in my world right now. One of the big things is that I am writing a book. It is a book about Jesus, pain, and hope, and it's being written with Waterbrook Press, who is a part of the rent... uh, Penguin Random House family. It's a pretty amazing, life-changing sort of opportunity. I'm really pumped about that. And, you know, sitting with your own pain and the struggles of real life and looking at Jesus as our inspiration for what it looks like to be human, this has been a heavy, heavy journey for me. And so I hope that as I get this first draft done and I move into sort of the editing process that you, if you think about it, if you're the praying type, you'll be praying for me. Um, I really want this to be something that's helpful for lots of people. And for those of you who have supported me, either through listening to these podcasts, my writing work, um, some of you have even supported me financially over the years through Patreon, just a huge thank you. It's, It's incredible to be working on something like this and to know that I have so many people around the world in my corner. I mean, it's absolutely a gift. So wanted to just share that. And if these episodes come a little sporadic. It's probably because I just don't have time to edit, but I do have quite a few in the hopper. You're going to be hearing from Nijay today. I have one with Walter Brueggemann coming up, Kara Meredith, um, Jay Kim. I mean, uh, oh my gosh, just so many great interviews. So I'm excited to share them with you today. We're talking with Nijay Gupta. He is a Uh, prolific theological writer. The guy is an expert on all things Pauline studies and the Gospels. And today, I think, is going to demonstrate why this guy is a huge gift, not just to the academy, but to the church. So with that said, hope you enjoy this conversation. And if you're not already tuned into the newsletter, I hope you'll go there as well, theologycurator.com slash newsletter. That's theologycurator.com slash newsletter to stay informed about kind of all of the things going on with this podcast and beyond it. Here's the interview. Have a great listen, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm sitting here with Nijay Gupta, and we are going to be talking about a couple of his books that have come out. Mostly, we're going to be looking at Paul and the Language of Faith, which is very new. Um, But we're also looking at, for a moment here, we're going to talk about the state of New Testament studies that he co-edited with Scott McKnight. Nijay, it's great to have you here, man. What a a gift. Thanks, Kurt. It is a pleasure, and I enjoy your podcast, so it's great to be a guest. Oh, man. Well, I know uh, about a year or two ago, I forget when it was, I kind of blew it. We had a <laughs> we had something <laughs> set up, and then I think I just, my calendar failed me or something happened. So I'm glad we finally reconnected here and are making this happen. Um, and, uh, dude, I would love to step into uh, your journey a little bit. I uh, want to hear your background and why... Here's a bottom line question. I ask a lot of scholars this, right? I ask them, 
why do you study the New Testament professionally? Like what led to that? Um, but give us the backstory and, um, you know, and anything else that feels relevant. Sure. Yeah, thanks. So just briefly, I grew up in North Central Ohio um, and I grew up actually as a Hindu. My parents are Hindu and I became a Christian when I was in high school as a teenager and I just fell in love with the Bible. Just it was so much comfort, so much wisdom for my life. And I went to college. I studied classics and public relations, which is an unusual combination, but they both helped me out. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> Say more. And uh, well, I wanted to study. I went to a state, you know, I went to a public uh, uh, secular university, Miami University of Ohio. And I, I was really, you know, wanting to study the Bible, but they didn't have, you know, biblical Greek. So they had classics. And I wanted to study classical Greek so I could study the Bible. And I didn't quite know the difference, but I knew it would help me. And so I did that. My parents really wanted me to have something more uh, profitable as a major than classics. Right. So, so I did kind of business, public relations kind of stuff, uh, which I thought could be helpful, which it has. Because I took a lot of courses in marketing, which has helped me as a scholar and things. But uh, then I want to go to seminary. Because I was really interested in ministry, I didn't know quite what I wanted to do, but I was interested in maybe missions or working with a parachurch organization, maybe being a pastor. I went to Gordon Conwell because um, Bill Mounts was the Greek professor yeah. there. Uh, he actually left before I got there, oh. just the summer before. Oh, ouch! Uh, but <laughs> Gary Pratico uh, is there, mm -hmm. uh, was there at the time, and he was a Hebrew professor. Douglas Stewart, uh, author, co-author of How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Yeah. Um, so there were a lot of kind of big, big biblical scholar, biblical languages kind of uh, people there. So I was really attracted to that. And actually, Kurt, I, I, you know, didn't think about going to academia at all. It wasn't really even on my mind. Hmm. Uh, I didn't like college that much. I didn't do especially well. And, uh, but in seminary, I had a chance to, because I had all these Greek classes from college, I had a chance to TA Greek at the seminary. And I just fell in love with studying Greek, teaching Greek, translating the New Testament. I just love digging into word studies and uh, using my concordance, which people used back then. Yep. And, and and try to figure, you know, hatch and red path and, you know, all this stuff. Studying Septuagint. I just got yeah. really into languages. I took I took Akkadian. I took uh, Syriac. I, I studied Coptic on my own. I just got really into languages, really wanted to study the Bible in depth. That's, and yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's, it reminds me too, you, you actually have, I think I have on my shelf somewhere, a volume by that you put out. That's maybe a, a reader through, is it Colossians maybe, or Galatians, Galatians. Yeah, Galatians and related texts. That's yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's even coming out of this love of language that you developed kind of early on in this journey. It sounds like. Absolutely. I, I, you know, one thing that was passed on to me at Gordon Conwell was preachers, people that, you know, preach sermons or teach Bible studies. We think we have to go to scholars for knowing what's right and wrong. But I was taught in seminary, um, sit down with your Greek uh, New Testament or Hebrew Old Testament and really just spend lots of time meditating on the text, translating, uh, better understanding what's there in that in that original language. And, and you'll learn so much that you didn't even realize you would learn before you jump right into all of the commentaries and Bible background stuff. And I, that's proven true for me. I pass it on to students. I teach Greek. I teach intermediate Greek. And I really feel like, you know, that's just been a huge passion of mine. That got me down the road, I think, of wanting to do academia is – I got excited about what I was learning and I just wanted to pass it on to other people. And that's kind of been what I do either in teaching or in book form. So I really wanted to study for PhD at a place where um, I didn't have to hide my Christian faith, but I would be really challenged to mm. kind of um, understand the best scholarship out there and make a really good argument for what I want to argue. So I ended up going to University of Durham in the UK and I got a chance to study with uh, Professor John Barclay and Dr. Stephen Barton, both uh, experts in their own areas. It was a wonderful experience. Jimmy Dunn, James D.G. Dunn, yeah. was a uh, retired emeritus professor, Lightfoot Professor of Divinity. Uh, you know, he was around, so I just asked uh, asked him, you know, would you be willing to have coffee every couple of months and talk? And oh. he said yes. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So that was amazing. Got a chance to spend time with him. I, I got a chance to uh, TA a course for N.T. Wright. 
when he was Bishop of Durham. Okay. And that was amazing. Just, you know, just to hear him teach in the classroom at Cranmer Hall, which is the Anglican uh, training school of, of Durham University. Uh, and so many legends there. I got to hear C.K. Barrett preach and he was in his 90s. Wow. Uh, I got to sit in the living room of uh, Charles Cranfield and talk about Romans. He was in his mid 90s. So it was just a wonderful experience. So I love this idea of taking the best of the academy and, and, and really bringing it into the church realm so the church can really be blessed by um, just enriching knowledge, challenging questions, great scholarship, uh, discoveries and Bible background stuff that's going to really uh, liven, liven up people's understanding of the Bible. Oh, man, what a, what a unique journey, man, to, to start out not from a Christian family— Mm -hmm. Find Jesus. How how old were you when you became a Christian? Uh, I was sixteen. Sixteen was that through like campus club, I, or how how did that come to be? It was actually through my brother. He was in college. I was in high school, and he uh, became a Christian through some of his friends. And then he would come home on the weekends uh, and minister to me and take me to church. And I just looked up to him and. And he kind of just uh, introduced me to a church in town that was very welcoming, and, and uh, I just uh, fell in love with that community, that church, fell in love with the gospel, fell in love with the Bible, and I just was on fire for the Lord almost immediately after um, after learning about the gospel. I mean, I, I, I joke that I, I was alive for 16 years without realizing Easter had anything to do with Jesus. I thought oh, it was just— yeah. I just thought it was a reason to eat chocolate. I had no mm -hmm. idea it was a religious holiday. That's how kind of unaware I was of the Christian tradition. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, a big shift, and it kind of speaks to our really bad marketing of Easter as Christians, I think. But that's another story, another day. But yeah, that's fascinating. And so you start this journey at sixteen. You just kind of move towards ministry, and ministry evolves into ministry within the context of academia. And right. that's a what a what a gift, man, to. Uh, be able to give to young thinkers and pastors in, in the way that you have. And now you have, uh, from, from Durham, you came back this way and you had a couple, you've had a couple of pit stops, uh, and right. that's maybe Several. not, <laughs> yeah, that might be a little, um, uh, tongue in cheek because some of them were probably more significant than pit stops. But so where have you taught and what's the journey look like there now? Well, it's helpful to know that when I graduated from my PhD program, it was right when the big market crash happened. Uh, mm. I graduated in 2009, uh, and um, so there were there weren't a lot of permanent jobs. A lot of places that would normally have permanent jobs switched over to kind of one year visiting positions. So I ended up mm. bouncing around to those. Just it was that period of of history where there just wasn't a lot available. And so I spent yeah. a year teaching at Ashland Seminary. It's actually my hometown, Ashland Theological Seminary. I grew up um, uh, with Ben Witherington. He was teaching at Ashland at the time. I yeah. grew up with his daughter. I actually went to high school with his daughter. Um, uh, so I, I didn't – I wasn't a Christian at the time. So yeah. I, I didn't know who he was, but I, I knew his daughter. Um, I spent Crazy. a year at Ashland teaching New Testament there. Then I got a two-year position at Seattle Pacific. Um, so I, I was in your neck of the woods yeah. for a couple of years and really enjoyed it there. Learned kind of the craft of teaching, I feel like. Hmm. I, I got a lot of uh, help from the university and kind of the craft of teaching and how to really make biblical studies interesting for freshmen, which I yeah. hadn't done before because I didn't go to Christian college. I wasn't familiar with these Christian ed courses, sure. uh, general, ge general education kind of courses. Um, then, uh, I had a one year position at Eastern university in Philadelphia. Uh, then I was a year for a year at Roberts Wesleyan college, their seminary, which is called Northeastern. And then, um, I, I, I got a kind of permanent job here at, uh, Portland seminary of George Fox university. And I've been here for five plus years. This is the, my sixth year here. Hmm. And it's been exciting just to be in a seminary context, which is my passion, to be working with pastors. I work with doctoral students and, uh, I, you know, they give me some opportunities to research and write too, which is very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome, man. That's a, uh, what a, <laughs> yeah. What a journey you've been on. And it's got to feel good because I know a lot of people from seminary days or even, um, you know, I, I did a second degree at the University of Washington uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, 
being there with folks that are like, yeah, I want to be a professor. I want to do all this stuff. And then <laughs> hearing over and over again, yeah, I can't find any jobs. You know, this, this has been a, right. a theme. So what a, what a cool thing that you've stuck with it and you continue to produce content along the way. And here mm -hmm. you are. Um, and you've been at this gig for a while and, um, your, I understand a transition is coming of some sort. Yeah, this is, this is just kind of newer development in terms of being able to announce this, but, um, come this summer, I'll be teaching as a professor full time for Northern seminary, uh, in the Chicago area. Um, so one of my, you know, dreams has been to be able to work with a colleague like Scott McKnight a prolific writer, mm -hmm. loves the church, um, committed to the church, but but known for Pauline scholarship, Jesus scholarship, uh, discipleship, and all kinds of great stuff. So it's just kind of a dream to be on that team with Scott, learn from him more directly, partner with him in some of those programs. So it's a unique yeah. arrangement. Actually, I'm going to stay here in Port, live here in Portland, and I will fly into Chicago to work with students in an intensive format and also to work with students online. But I'm really excited because Northern, I feel like, is one of those seminaries out there who understands real ministry. Real ministry is busy. Real mm -hmm. ministry, you can't uproot people and move them to Chicago all the time. So it allows people to stay where they, where they are, whether it's California or Texas or the Netherlands. Hmm. And they can do a really good master's degree or doctoral degree. Uh, and work with people like Scott, and I'm excited to be a part of that. Yeah, wow, that's great. And uh, Scott, of course, is a friend not only to me but to this show. He's been mm -hmm. on here, man. He's he's probably been on here three or four <laughs> times now. Well, yeah. look, look, when you guys keep pumping out content. Um, I feel like I miss like with Scott, right. I'm like, oh man, I should have done an interview on right. pastor Paul and I haven't done that yet. You know? So it's like, ah. it's a great book. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I feel like, you know, he and I will work really well together because, um, we think very similarly about how to blend academic studies with ministry. And so I'm just really, uh, excited about the, the partnership of opportunities there and the code you know, the cooperation uh, uh, in terms of the curriculum and, and using our strengths in different ways. Yeah, that's no, that's exciting. And in fact, you guys recently co-edited a volume, The State of New Testament Studies, a survey yes. of recent research. And correct me if I'm wrong, is this a kind of a reboot of the face of New Testament studies with and you kind of have taken over the role of Osborne. Is that is that kind of what this is? Yeah, I mean, I think of it as kind of an homage or you know something like that. It's 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 trying to you know do that again for another era. Um, it, you know, the, the face of New Testament studies is only about 15 years old, but it seems like a whole lot has happened. Yeah. Uh, at least it, when you look at the that volume, which was spectacular, and I remember being so excited about in seminary and spending a lot of time with it and and treasuring it as a resource. You look at it and it's so different mm -hmm. than even the way we approach, not just the content, but even the way we approach New Testament studies is different because the face of New Testament studies focused on figures, Paul, James, Peter, mm. and now we don't really think specifically in those terms because of just how complicated some of those epistles are mm -hmm. and, and thinking about the Gospels being about Jesus, but also some of the challenges of studying Jesus through the Gospels uh, in light of discussions of the historical Jesus study er realm. And then same thing with Peter and Peter and the Petrine literature, John and the Johannine literature. So we, we approach things differently. Methods are different. Um, and even, uh, you know, who these scholars are who are writing these essays for State New Testament studies. At that time in 2004, it was a lot of kind of late career um white male uh, hmm. scholars. They were spectacular. They were the experts at the time, but we've we've kind of seen a shift now yeah. where we really want to recruit a broader group of people. So we have scholars from Australia and the UK and, uh, you know, people of different backgrounds, African-American, Jamaican, all over the place. So it's really hmm. cool, uh, cool uh, group of people as well as content. Yeah, no. And I mean, I'm, I'm thumbing through it right now. And what, what would you say? Like, so someone who is like, I love new Testament studies and they step into this book. Does it summarize just some of the core debates? Like what are some of the things they should expect out of it as they uh, step into it? 
Yeah, well, um, you know, there, there are two different kinds of essays in the book. Some are specifically on New Testament texts, mm-hmm. like Matthew or Romans, and it's really giving you the state of the discussion. What have scholars been talking about? What have been the most interesting and formative conversations that have happened in the last 15 to 20 years on Romans, mm, yeah. uh, on Matthew, on Acts, on Hebrews, and so forth. Um, but then the other type of essays in there are thematic, mm, and okay. they're dealing with key topics. So for example, Christology, which is one of my favorite essays in the book by David Capes, you know, I mean, one of the most important conversations, and there's been a lot that's happened in the last 20 years, uh, stuff with Larry Hurtado and Richard Bauckham and things like that. Mm-hmm. Lots of newer Chris Tilling, lots of interesting conversations that have been happening. And you really want to guide someone that can kind of walk you through all of that. Because like you were saying, you miss things and maybe some things you don't understand. And mm-hmm. I did one on New Testament ethics. It was interesting in, in the face New Testament studies. That doesn't ever seem to have crossed anybody's mind to talk about New Testament ethics. Wow. So I thought we really need uh, an essay on this because this is seemingly something very, very important. So yeah. there's lots of new stuff. There's an essay by Dennis Edwards on on exegesis and hermeneutics. Basically, what are the methods and perspectives and approaches that scholars use to study the Bible, specifically the New Testament? And uh, Dennis does a fantastic job of laying out the panoply of different methods that yeah. are there the proliferation of methods. You really need some guidance and help, and that's what this book does. Oh, man. Well, that's great. And I, yeah, I I imagine if you're listening right now, if you're someone who wants to go deeper, maybe you're a graduate of seminary and you're like, man, I really want to know what's going on since I've been in seminary. It seems like this would be a great resource. So thanks. Thanks. Yeah. For uh, all the hard work you put into it and uh, looking forward to thumbing through it even more. Um, the, the book we're really talking about today though, is Paul in the language of faith. Now, Nijay, I've got to ask you, man, you, how many books have you written now? Uh, around 10 maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, what a, what a busy, busy typer you must be my friend, but, (laughs) um, it's, it's really exciting and you kind of dip into both Paul and Jesus stuff, right? Like that's kind of both and for you to an extent. Well, you know, I'm I'm kind of a big picture person, and so when you study Paul, you can't just study Paul. He doesn't exist in a vacuum. He exists in this, you know, a stream and heritage that includes, obviously, the Old Testament and Jewish literature, uh, but also the gospel tradition. You know, obviously, the gospels were written mostly after Paul's writings that we have, but you know, I was really interested in what were, what were the biggest influences on Paul and the way he uses faith language and in his theology. And, you, just, you know, you just can't ignore the the Jesus tradition mm-hmm. that's behind the Gospels, because surely when, you know, I'm, I'm doing some research on Galatians, so I'm thinking about when he goes to Peter and he, you know, talks to him about Jesus and the church. Mm-hmm. Um, what are they talking about? And surely they're talking about the life of Jesus, the right. ministry of Jesus, the sayings of Jesus, the activities, his death, and so forth. So Paul knew some of these things that eventually became part of the Gospels, and and surely that was a major part of the development of his theology. And so I wanted to draw that out. So one of the key chapters is on faith language in the Jesus tradition. Ooh, wow, yeah. And that, that I think, is uh, really valuable. You know, I often, and we don't have to go off on this too long, but it's interesting. So many times I'm talking about Paul, because a lot of this podcast is about Paul. And, uh, right. you know, I, I get these comments from people online like, you know, Paul was bad, Jesus good, or, right, um, right, you know, right. we can't trust Paul because he changed the tradition. You got to right. focus on the Gospels because they're all about Jesus. And I'm like, you know, Paul was doing his thing a little earlier than those Gospels. Right. Now, of course, there's tradition behind it, but but it's just fascinating the uh, the polls that um, it creates for some people, not many, but some. And I love I love the idea of saying, no, let's look at the Jesus tradition because that's that's what Paul has inherited. I mean, that's what he's been right. processing. So so as we do that, I mean, you're looking at the word faith. Now, catch people up to the conversation up until your book about faith. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a thumbnail sketch, but I think I, I was going to talk about this anyway because I think this is one of the reasons why I wrote the book. So um, I, one of the big topics that I want to address through this book is something scholars call divine and human agency in Paul. What this means is scholars, you know, have been 
wrestling with and wondering about the, the answer to the question, when it comes to the biblical view of salvation, what role do humans play and what role does God play? Yeah. And th- that's a very vibrant conversation. There's been a lot of contributions to this. Um, and one answer is nothing. Humans do nothing. Right. And so if you look at someone like Martin Luther or more properly the Lutheran tradition in some circles, they want to view faith as something that can be juxtaposed to doing. Hmm. So doing tries to accomplish salvation or kind of uh, uh, energize or create salvation, but faith is kind of just leaving it to God. Yeah. And so I've noticed, especially actually in the writings in more recent years of Douglas Moo and Thomas Schrenner, they both kind of reinvest in this kind of Lutheran style argument that Paul juxtaposed believing and doing, hmm. and believing in, in some way is meant to contrast with doing such that it is not doing, it's a, it's a non-doing kind of thing. And so you have that view, we might call hmm. kind of Lutheran style view, and then you have kind of a more recent years, the growth development of an apocalyptic perspective. Sure. This is people like Beverly Gaventa, Douglas Campbell, Martin DeBoer, and it goes back to uh, Lou Martin, or it's Kesemann. And it is a, a view that I call pure divine agency, where if it's 100% God, then we don't even really, the focus shouldn't even really be on our faith. You know, even though Luther mm. said that it shouldn't really be in our faith, it should be on the faithfulness of God. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so then when you have something like Galatians 3, when faith came, those scholars say, OK, that's not talking about human faith. Obviously, it's talking about what kind of pistis. Pistis is the Greek word for faith. It's talking about the faithfulness of God. And I started looking at that conversation and, and, and I thought that something seems off about that now. At the same time as I was eavesdropping on that conversation, I was asked to write a dictionary article for the Lexham Bible Dictionary on faith in the Bible, the whole Bible, Mm. including the Old Testament. And it had occurred to me that faith was really a subject of interest in the Old Testament. Yeah. I thought, okay, New Testament faith, Old Testament law or covenant or whatever. Hmm. And But once I started the investigation, I was looking at the word pistis in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament – also in Josephus, Philo, Old Testament pseudepigrapha, and then the many, many thousands of documents in the Greco-Roman world, the pagan world, the Greek documents of that world, like uh, Xenophon and yeah. um, you know Thucydides and all those people. And what I noticed was Jews were very comfortable using pistis as an everyday word for relationships of mutuality and concord. Mm -hmm. And this was just a very common term in the ancient world for faithfulness, loyalty, commitment. Uh, You see it in marriage contracts. You see it in business deals. You see it in political treaties. You see it in uh, war allies. They often talk about pistis. And what was really surprising to me is they would often pair pistis with the the verbs for doing, like poieo. Hmm. You would make pistis. That means you would establish a a mutual commitment to each other. Yeah. And so that kind of blew open that, you know, issue of is Paul representing it pistis as the opposite of working? Hmm. And to me, that wouldn't make any sense at all, given the many, 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 many times that pistis is used uh, as as something you do. Even in Matthew 23, Jesus criticizes the Pharisees, saying, you neglected to do the weightier matters of the law, and he lists pistis as one of those things. So he actually links pistis and doing right there in Matthew 23. Yeah. And so one of the, you know, to, ca- to catch you up on that conversation, I felt like there was a way to redeem or rethink uh, about the role that humans play with pistis in this kind of divine human agency in the relationship with God, I don't think it's a matter of working in in terms of a formula, like a zero sum game. We do 20%, God does 80, you know, humans do 5%, God does 95. I don't think of it like that. I don't think Paul thought about it like that, but I I invest in an argument and we could talk about this more if, if we have time. I invest in an argument that Jews became comfortable using pistis in the time period of Paul and Jesus as a way of talking about covenant participation. Hmm. Yeah. And I have I have a whole section on there on the on the Septuagint. I have a big section on there in Josephus where I talk about how Josephus uses pistis as a way of talking about covenant. Yeah. And 
when you then look at Paul, when he says when faith came, I don't think he's talking about human faith. I don't think he's talking about just the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. I think he's talking about the emergence of a whole new way of relating to God. That's the relational element of pistis. A whole new way of relating to God through what I call the Christ relation. Hmm. So pistis can be a summary word or a catch word for the Christ relation, this way of mediating that distance between humans and God through a connection and relationship with Jesus Christ. He can summarize that using the word pistis. That can become his way of talking about uh, a relationship of mutuality with God through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh that's fascinating and you know, I'm I'm curious as I hear you talk about this and um you know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Matthew Bates and some of the yes. books he's done. Yes. Um how how complementary are your guys's conversations? I know he's writing a little bit more maybe popular level at, right. at some in some sense, but are are there compliments? I know he uses the word allegiance quite a bit for this. Yeah. So mm-hmm. so what are some of the things that you're doing that are similar or different as far as you understand it? Yeah, I think we're on the same page in what we reject. And what we reject is both a formulaic approach to salvation where it's like, oh, it's this mathematical formula. We both reject that. Mm -hmm. We both reject a simplistic view that pistis means faith. Faith as in something you believe with your brain, but, you know, then, you know, that's all you need to do or say the sinner's prayer or whatever. We both both reject that. We both agree that – we should be comfortable translating pistis in the New Testament as faithfulness or allegiance or loyalty or something like that. Mm-hmm. I think where we differ is, and our differences aren't kind of diametrically opposed, but what I want to add to the conversation is more nuance in the many different ways pistis can be translated. I talk about pistis as a very strange Greek word. Most words mean just one thing, mm-hmm. one basic thing, like uh, uh, table means table. Right. right. Uh, or or pen means pen. You, you, you know, pen doesn't mean pen and helicopter. Yeah. But you take a word like pistis and pistis has one core meaning, uh, but uh, it, it can it can have so, so many different connotations or nuances. It can mean opinion. It can mean something entrusted to somebody. It can mean something similar to faithfulness or obedience. It can mean something like belief. Uh, it can mean trust. It has all these shades of meaning, and one of my burdens or concerns is that translators should be more comfortable offering different translations in the New Testament for pistis based on the context. And mm-hmm. so I think sometimes it should be translated as faith or belief, like in Second Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Mm-hmm. I think faith makes sense there because he's leaning more into how believers see all of reality with their minds. But in other places, I think we should be more comfortable translating it allegiance or faithfulness. Um, In 1 Thessalonians, for example, where Paul's saying, you know, I sent Timothy to check on you to see how your faith is. And he wants Mm -hmm. to know they're persevering in the faith, that they're they're moving forward, that they're trusting God uh, with their whole selves, their whole bodies, their whole lives. So one of the things I want to add is kind of this more – nuanced approach. I call pistis as a word that modulates across the spectrum of meaning. Mm-hmm. From one end, believing faith, which is more cognitive. The other end would be obeying faith, which is more uh, active with the body, mind, heart, soul. But then you have some instances which are more all-encompassing. I, I would say that's trusting faith. It's kind of the, the movement of our will, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So I want to add the nuances there. The last thing I'll say about Matt's work, and, and it's fantastic, and I think he did a great job, uh, and he just came out with an article for Currents of Biblical Research that gives more of the, the academic kind of oh. uh, underpinnings to his work. But um, the one thing I'll say is he focuses a lot on allegiance as following or obeying King Jesus. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of that is um, evocative of Scott McKnight's work and, and, mm-hmm. and Joshua Jip. And uh, I, I agree with all that. I think that fits better the Gospels. I think it's it's harder to use that model in Paul. Hmm. Uh, because the kind of kingship element is not so clearly there in Paul. I take a little bit more covenantal and participationistic approach to Paul's use of pistis, and Matt takes a little bit more of a um, royal, royal, uh, imperial kind of 
flavor to his use of pistis. I think that's more a matter of me focusing only on Paul and him kind of having more of an orientation towards the Gospels. Yeah. yeah. Um, he deals with the whole New Testament, but I, I think his gravity, his center of gravity is in the Gospels. Yeah. And my yeah. center of gravity is in Paul, so I, I treat that a little bit differently. I have a section on his – I have a little section on his book in my – Paul in the language of faith, but I, I think we're pulling the same direction. He he disagrees with me on some some things, but not on the big things. Yeah, yeah, and that's I mean that's what makes scholarship fun, right? When you're basic, you guys are in the same school of thought for the most yes. part, you know, and yes. um, you're gonna hang out, have a drink, be like, ah, you're wrong here. Oh, dude, yes. but we're totally like when it comes to big picture, like on the same playing field here you know and that that that's fun right we i think we see modeled um in at least i think people imagine that in scholarship christians on this side or that side and they hate each other and really my experience has been there's a lot of people that have nuanced ideas that can sit together and it's cool it's fine let's let's make each other better and um, even folks who from a distance might look like they're very similar and and so I think it's really really exciting and you know as you as you've stepped into this content I mean what what's your sense that this will be a payoff for the local church I, right. you, you mentioned your love for the local church and so I'm curious right. you know Faith is a big word for people. And, you know, when we talk with Matthew Bates, he's like, yes, and we need to reframe the gospel so that people understand what they're aligning with. Um, so I'm curious mm-hmm. uh, where, where you would go with your book as you think of the congregation yeah. in general. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's so many, so many things that came out of this that I think is important. First and foremost, I would want to say um, – uh, Paul's theology is thoroughly Christocentric, meaning mm-hmm. everything is about knowing and trusting in and being connected to Jesus. Uh, one of my favorite episodes of The Simpsons has uh, Homer at home, and he stopped going to church, and yeah. he's sitting at home doing nothing. And Reverend Lovejoy has a group of people with him, and he comes to Homer's house and knocks on his door. And Homer opens the door, and he sees all these people, and he says, Reverend Lovejoy, is this about Jesus? And then Reverend Lovejoy says, Homer, everything's about Jesus. <laughs> and, you I love know what? It. Simpsons, oh. once again, telling the theological truth. For Paul, everything is about Jesus. And yes. One thing I've learned from from uh, Luther and from uh, Bonhoeffer mm-hmm. and Kasemon, too, actually all Lutherans. <laughs> yeah, Lutherans, wow. Both Lutheran, but mm-hmm. all Lutherans is um, – Paul had no theology. If we think of theology as a sort of set of doctrines, right? Uh, what he had was a vibrant and passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes. And um, so it's interesting. You know, I told you I wrote on New Testament ethics, and and Bonhoeffer and Casemann both said in their works. Um, there is no such thing as a New Testament ethic. And I remember first reading that wow. thinking, that doesn't seem right. But what they meant by that is if we define ethics as a rule book for doing what is good and that when we, when we want to know how to do what's good, we, uh, we appeal to the rule book, they said that's going to get you off track because that's mm. going to get you away from Jesus. Yeah. And when you look at it from that perspective, Paul is exactly on the same page as that. Um yeah. So I would say when it comes to faith and people are like, what should I believe and what's right and what's wrong? I think Paul would say, don't stress out about it. Hmm. Turn, turn to Christ, you know, unite yourself with Christ, cling to Christ. And um, that's the ethic is the oneness with Christ and the obedience to Christ and the leaning on his chest and the listening to Christ and all of that. And so a, a big piece of that is, you know, theology is not important. It's not significant unless it has this essential uh, Christocentricity, this clinging to Jesus, which is, yeah. you know, if you read between the lines, you could see me say that over and over again in the book, because mm-hmm. that's kind of the hard, that was my big discovery is, uh, you know, faith is all about knowing, trusting, uniting with Christ. Uh, so I'd want to encourage people with that message. If they're wondering, mm-hmm. why am I at church? Why am I a Christian? We live in a world where we don't, it's really hard to tell what's right and wrong with fake news, the internet, and yeah. political arguments, theological arguments. 
And when I get lost and I get confused, I go back to those basic principles. It's all I go back to Reverend Lovejoy. Yes. <laughs> Everything's about Jesus. Oh, yes. On, on the other end of that, I would want to affirm with people, faith is not this you know, document that you stick in your wallet hmm. that says, I'm a Christian. Uh, faith is, uh, is, on the one hand, essentially cognitive, but it's not cognitive like a list of things we believe, as if we go to heaven and God has this checklist— and he's going to say, did you believe in the Trinity? Did you believe it? You know, it, yeah. it's, it's cognitive in the sense it shapes the way we see all of reality. I think about 2 Corinthians, Paul says, uh, we used to know uh, Christ from a from a fleshly perspective, katasarka. Mm. We don't look at him that way any longer. In fact, we know no one according to the flesh any longer. What he means by that is because we've had to change our mind about Jesus mm-hmm. and see Jesus in a whole new light. That means we have to see everything in a whole new light. And Paul can use Pistis to talk about a whole new way of seeing reality, what I call in the book, Believing the Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, uh, Another part of that, though, is not just committing our whole imagination to Christ, but committing our whole bodies and our whole life orientation. And so um, that's where I think that I'd resonate a lot with Matt Bates's work because I want people to know that when they confess their faith uh, on Sunday morning, they're confessing something that's going to challenge them and drive them and move them and force them to do difficult things every day of the week. Mm-hmm. I remember in a, reading in a book somewhere, I can't remember, but where um, someone was asking a Jewish person and a Christian the differences between their religion, and the Jewish person said, uh, a, a Jewish a Jewish person said, a Jew uh, practices the religion every day, and a Christian practices the religion religion only one day a week. Hmm. And I just felt such an indictment <laughs> yeah. of the church in there. You know, is faith this sort of thing I do in singing worship songs for 30 minutes on a Sunday? Or is faith something that is actually pushing and driving me in every minute of every day from morning to night because this is who I am in Christ? Yeah. And so I want people to be comfortable transiting faith as loyalty, allegiance, life orientation, you know, things like that. It, it becomes even a catchword faith for the Christian religion. Paul says in Galatians, uh, he was preaching the faith. And I want to be able to translate that as preaching the Christ relation, uh, <laughs> because that that gives it more of a sociology to it rather than I'm preaching a religion that I can write down on a piece of paper. Yeah. That, wow. That's not, what it, that's not what Paul means by pistis at all. Yeah. Well, let me just say you had me at Homer Simpson, but, <laughs> but, uh, dude, I mean, so much is coming to my mind. I mean, one of the things that, uh, I just resonate with in a huge way is the, the reality that pistis it's relational. There is this union with Jesus that we're invited into. And I think that, um, rather than an abstract idea about God, we get to know God intimately connected. Um, it's beautiful. So thanks for sharing that. And it is all about Jesus, man. And I'm really just excited about the work you're doing in this book and hope folks will pick it up. Of course, it is it out in early February? So, so, you know, it's listed as coming out in February, but actually Urban's told me that they've released backorder copies to Amazon and other places like christianbook.com and Target and whatever. So actually, if you go to Target and you go to Amazon uh, or christianbook.com, you can actually get it now. I have people tell me I just got it in the mail. So it's available everywhere. Apparently, even though it has a kind of February release date, they, they, you know, they just thought the book's done early. Let's go ahead and release it. So thankfully, you know, you can go ahead and use your Christmas money now yeah, and go ahead and pick it up. And um, one of my things, I don't know how you feel about this, Kurt, but one of my things is I don't like long books mm, yes. because I get so excited about reading 10 different books. I want to be able to get it through quickly. So I want to write something that was going to be digestible. Someone could read in a couple of weeks or a month. They don't have to spend a whole summer trying to get through an 800, 900,000 yeah. page book. 
So I, I like writing shorter things that are going to be really interesting. You could do for group study or something. So I'm hoping it'll get used and read and people will read it from beginning to end because it's not a thousand pages long. Hey, check you out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's under 200. I mean, that's awesome that's right. for an academic book. Um, <laughs> hey, this has been really fun. And um, something we didn't say explicitly is that uh, James Dunn is the forward writer to this. Yes. So he's excited yes. about it. Of course, we know that he is um, central to the whole conversation around the new perspective and really a founding father, I guess you could say, in that zone, yes. that lane. Architect. Yeah, yes. I call him an architect. There you go. Yeah. yeah. You know, I have a personal uh, friendship with Professor Dunn, but he's probably played the biggest role in forming who I am as a th- Pauline theologian, if I can call myself that. Oh, yeah. And so I just thought, gosh, if I could dedicate this book to him, that would be great, which I did. And then he agreed to do the forward. So that's kind of a dream come true oh. to have my name on the cover uh, next to his name is 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 worth it all to me. Wow. Wow. Well, friends, I hope you'll go get this book. Nijay, you are just doing amazing things. And we'll definitely have another conversation. Now, you have some projects like in the hopper that are about to come out. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, actually, um, we were just talking about Jesus and Paul. And, and I have a book coming out called Beginner's Guide to New Testament Studies. Yeah. It's with Baker. It's a kind of um, my take on 13 debated issues in New Testament studies like Jesus and Paul, empire, mm. you know, in the New Testament, women in leadership in the New Testament, synoptic problem, Pauline theology, new perspective. So I take 13 issues and I basically say, what are the two sides? And I talk about why they exist and what are kind of the pressure points. So that's coming out with Baker awesome. in March. And then Mike Bird and I wrote a commentary on Philippians for right. Cambridge. And it's really fun. I quote the Lord of the Rings in there. Okay. Uh, Mike is his normal goofy self. Yeah. And yet it's full of great academic wisdom. It was our my first time co-writing a book with somebody, uh, especially a commentary. And so I just, it was so much fun. It's a it actually is really useful for pastors, even though I hope scholars will be interested in it as well. So that's on Philippians, Cambridge Press in the summer. Awesome. Well, hey, let's uh, do another conversation around the beginner's guide and the commentary Definitely. when they come out. Let's do this. Thanks, Kurt. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, folks want to track you down. Of course, you've got your blog. Is it Sola Crux? Crux Sola, Crux, yeah. Crux, Crux Sola, yeah. 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 Um, if you just search on my name, that's the easiest way and it'll come up. Yeah, no, awesome. And you always have great articles there. And then one last thing I've got to say, you've got a little guide for folks who are listening right now. You're, you're thinking to yourself, I think I might want to do PhD work in biblical studies. What's your guide called? And, it's um, called Prepare, Succeed, Advance. Yes. And it's a guidebook to doing a PhD in biblical studies. It's just some of my, you know, the wisdom I picked up along the way about how to best prepare and applications and kind of navigating the academic world. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I've utilized it. I'm not pursuing PhD right now, but definitely um, have utilized it in some of the conversations I've had over the last couple of years discerning if I'm going to do that or not. So I I recommend it from personal use. So, hey, I'm going to stop uh, tooting the horn about all your projects and just say thank you. And, um, dude, we hope to do this again with you. And um, may the transitions you're going through be fruitful for the kingdom, my friend. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Theology Curator. For more resources from Kurt Willems, check out theologycurator.com forward slash newsletter to sign up for our email update list. For new listeners of the podcast, we hope you will subscribe via iTunes, Google, or your podcast manager of choice. If you like what you hear, please leave the show a review. For regular listeners, consider supporting Kurt's online ministry at patreon.com forward slash Kurt Willems. Lastly, please don't let this conversation end when the episode is over. We hope you feel empowered in regular life to explore theology and faith in intelligent and humanizing ways.